I have a new version of my Belgian wit beer that I affectionately call Lair Garden, right here. You want to see my 2017 version of this? Keep watching. Several years back, uh, circa 2013 or so, I did a Belgian wit, wit beer style uh, beer video called Lair Garden, which was my sort of whole garden impersonation. Not quite exactly, but it was what I was aspiring to make. And I did that video back then, several years back, and it was a very lengthy video. Uh, the video and audio quality weren't that great, and I've made some tweaks to the recipe since then. And, uh, and I know what you're thinking. Oh, Larry, you ran out of ideas for a new video, so you look through your old ones and find ways to do it better. I'd never done that before. Yeah, I have. It was my uh, <laughs> my uh, how to low and slow videos where I did the acorn back uh, back in 2012, and I did the updated Kamado Joe one several years later as well. Yeah, okay. So I did set a precedent for that, but I thought it was going to be worth your while to see how I make this version of beer different than the one in that old 2013 video. I think this one is better than that last one, and I want to share it with you. And if you want to know how I make this batch and what I did to make changes to it, keep watching. Okay folks, you know the drill. If you've been watching my channel for a while now, um, this is my brew sheet, my recipe template, and uh, this is my latest incarnation of my Lair Garden. Uh, as of today, uh, May 21st, 2017, the uh, old video I had done uh, four, four years ago now, wow, time flies, uh, was slightly different than this, but uh, and I can show you the other one um, in a minute, and I'll put actually a link to the old video in the video description for you to see but uh, what I have here is just some two row malt five pounds uh, about four pounds of flaked wheat and one pound of flaked oats now uh, for those who don't know what flake means these are uh, non malted grains so uh, whereas the pale malt is malted uh, where it's sprouted and dried and, and is ready to uh, give up its sugars the flaked wheats and the flaked oats are just plain wheats and oats which have been gelatinized or uh, sort of pre-cooked for use in here and these contribute a unique flavor which defines partially the Belgian wit beer style. So make sure that you follow this correctly. Do not get wheat malt, get flaked wheat or even torrified wheat or torrified oats, okay? And over to, on to the hot bill, uh, this is supposed to be a lightly hopped beer. The because the coriander down here and the orange peel are supposed to shine uh, through on this so you don't want too much too much in the hop uh, side so I have a 60 minute edition of some Hallertau hops pellets uh, as you can see one ounce of them at 3.8 alpha and uh, a finishing hop sort of partial aroma partial flavor of Saz uh, at 3 uh, alpha percentage points at one ounce at 10 minutes left in the boil in addition to that, my Belgian wit beer. I have a uh, Belgian wit beer 3944 from Y yeast uh, in here as well. I use this for all my wit beers, as well as a yeast starter, which I made in advance. And if you've never done a yeast starter before, I have a video on that that you can go check out. I'll put the link below. Some rice hulls, which is uh, you might wonder, well, uh, what's a rice hull? Well. When you make wheat beers like we are up here with the wheats, especially the um, unmalted wheats, but all the kind of the wheat grains can uh, can gum up your your laundering and sparging process later. So uh, these rice hulls are there to help uh, filter and prevent the clogging of your mesh or your screen or your manifold in your mash tun. Okay, so those are just sort of functional, not for flavor. I also have um, an amount of one ounce of bitter orange peel, uh, dry bitter orange peel. You can buy these at homebrew shops or online. I uh, do not use the sweet orange peel. I started off making beers with sweet orange peel and although it does provide a unique flavor, it is not a Belgian wit beer style beer. That you're making something else at that, at that point and it's not that. So get the bitter orange peel uh, and some chamomile tea, a few tea bags worth of chamomile tea. Trust me, this is uh, not a secret ingredient obviously because I'm sharing it with you, but this is an ingredient which actually makes the beer much more refreshing and light and uh, more of a lawnmower type beer more of a whole garden light beer important ingredient as well as some coriander that you crush and crack and another ounce of that so putting all this together with my mash variables over here 
I'm ready to get brewing. Now, for those of you who wanted to see my old recipe, uh, really briefly here, uh, from four years ago, uh, I, it's largely the same. It's the same green bill, but it looks like all I really changed here was my hops, where I, in the past I used uh, BC Goldings and Saz. So um, everything else seems to be the same. So if you're wondering what the difference was, it was, it was basically, it was really just the hops. So now I'm using Hallertown Saz rather than Goldings and Saz. That's it, so let's get brewing. Now I have all my grains collected, the flaked wheat, the flaked oats, the two row malt, my, my malt mill, and my drill. So I'm gonna go ahead and crush this all up. For those of you that wanna know what flaked oats or wheat are like, this is what the flaked oats are right here. They're just kind of flat and compressed and dried, okay? So that's how they look. That's the oats. And here is the flaked wheat. It looks very similar to the flaked oats, but uh, you know, because they're flaked, I mean, that's the process. And all the greens are in here now. Now, b before you ask the question, let me answer it for some of you who are about to ask this question. Uh, did I crush the flaked oats and wheat? And the answer is no, there is no need to crush flaked oats or wheat. They are not malt, they're not, they don't have the husks on them anymore. Uh, the whole point of putting them through the mill is to crush the malt, which is not what those are. So I did crush my five pounds of uh, pale malt, which is in the bottom here. And I just, for convenience sake, I just went ahead and dumped in the uh, flaked oats and wheat in here. So just, just keep that in mind. You, you do not need to crush them. And in fact, even trying to crush them is unnecessary and a pain in the butt um, at times too, because of how slick they are and they don't feed in the, into the rollers that well. So there you go. I also went ahead and threw in my rice hulls, about a half a pound's worth. Uh, I buy these rice hulls in one pound bags and I don't like having odd uh, ratios of ingredients kind of lingering around. Uh, so I go ahead and use about a half a bag, about a half pound's worth. I balled it basically, I didn't weigh it or nothing. And uh, the other half pound now I'll use again for a new batch of wheat beer or wheat, wheat beer or whatever in the near future. So there you go, go with that. But again, these rice hulls um, are not uh, contributing any flavor. They're just there for function. So you can just eyeball that amount. Huh. I'm heating up my strike water. And while I'm doing that, uh, I wanted to, to check my measurements of my ambient grain temperature. So I stuck my uh, thermopen uh, deep into my crushed grain pile and did not get my, uh, my default value of 68. I got 66.5. So that is going to impact the strike water temperature that I want to add. So I'm going to sh show you why my brewing spreadsheet is really useful um, because I can make adjustments on the fly on my phone or tablet. I have my iPad mini here, but I could use my phone as well, as long as it's a smartphone and has the ability to open spreadsheets. But I have my, my recipe sheet open here with my brew house set up in calcs tab here. I just pick on the cell I want to change down the bottom here. I back up a value and type in my new one, 66.5. All right, check that. And now I can go back to my, um, my tab recipe sheet. and see that my strike value temperature now is 162.1. So I come back here and uh, change this value to 162.1. So I know now to adjust it by just a couple points of a degree. It, it doesn't seem like a lot, but actually for the amount of water being put in, um, every degree of strike water temperature has a pretty big final influence on the final mash temperature that I'm shooting for, which in this case looks like about 150. Um, so, you know, I could have um, overshot this or undershot this by a lot, just by a few points here. So I'm going for 162.1 instead of 161.9. I could have just let, let this go and it probably would have turned out fine, but I have the ability here to adjust on the fly with my brewing spreadsheet. And I see that as a huge advantage in using my spreadsheet over other tools that are available for doing brewing calcs. All right, let's, let's check out the strike water here, shall we? 162.3, 0.4, 0.5, okay. 
uh, right around 162 point something, which is about 162.1 was my target. So I'm okay with that. I'm ready to mash, folks. Got my mash tun uh, preheating with some uh, hot water, some near boiling water for several minutes to preheat the inside. And I'm ready to empty this out. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, add my strike water from my kettle below into here and mix in my grains. Okay. Now for the grains. Oh, a little more in there. Go ahead and stir that in. Yep, 149.9 or 150 or 150.1, depending on uh, the moment I'm looking at it. So it's right on the money. So I'm going to go ahead and cover this thing up. Nice and tight. And I'm going to mash this thing for 90 minutes. Okay, let's check out our sparge water here. 185.6. So that's a little hotter than I would typically normally do for a sparge water, but uh, I'm using wheat and a little hotter water is called for to help thin out the mash to let it run off into the kettle without getting stuck as a stuck sparge. So a little hotter is preferred for a wheat beer. Okay, let's take off the mash tun lid here and give it a little bit of a smell here. Hmm, yep. This is a good, gonna be a good beer. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stir this up, mix it up together. Uh, my first draining step I think calls for about six quarts of water. So I'm gonna add six quarts of water, stir it all in really good and boil off it. Six. All right, that's six uh, quarts added per my spreadsheet. Stir it all in together. All right, let's boil off. All right, let's go ahead and drain this first uh, step here into the kettle. All right, the first drain step is done. Time to move on to the second drain step. Now for the second drain step, I need to add about 14.7 quarts uh, of, uh, of sparge water. So let's get that going. All right, let's go ahead and stir that in. Okay, now I'm gonna let this sit for a few more minutes before I start draining again. All right, it's time to boil off again for the second step. Well, let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and drain this one now. All right, there we go, seven gallons. Right at the very end of the, uh, it's starting to bubble out, bubble out of here too. So exactly seven gallons, and that's what I was shooting for, and that's what I got. It's a 90-minute boil, mind you, not a 75-minute boil. I'm going to lose a lot more of this evaporation than I normally do for a normal batch. So I got up to seven gallons um, in order to account for that. So that's that's what I wanted, and that's what I got. So there we go. And there's the leftover. Grains, spent grains. I'm going to use this in my compost pile out back for my garden. Once it cools, that is. As it's coming to a boil, I'm going to go ahead and put some yeast nutrient in. It's not required for a beer like this, but it's a habit of mine to go ahead and do on most of my beers. So I'm just doing it on a habit, basically. But about a teaspoon's worth. Throw it in the boil. All right, uh, the, the boil is just starting. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, mark this at the 90-minute mark. This is going to be a 90-minute boil because of the uh, weed in here. They, they could benefit from an extra 30 minutes or an extra 15 minutes or so. So a whole 90 minute boil. We'll come back in a half hour when it's time to add the uh, next addition, which will be hops. As you can see here, I'm skimming off some of the hot break as well. And we'll be, and we'll be back. I thought I'd show you my boil additions all while well, they're all together here before I start putting them in. 
starting from, well, starting from the right, I guess, I got my German Hallertau bittering hops, my Czech Saz uh, flavor and aroma hop. I got three packages of uh, chamomile tea. This tea bags, I'm gonna tear these up and put them in like a little bowl and dump them in uh, without the bags. I got some coriander seed, one ounce from my local homebrew shop, and uh, quite frankly, uh, they charge a lot. I normally just buy a big giant bag for, a, for the same price or, or less. Uh, at the local grocery store or or even from my garden from my uh, when my cilantro seeds go to seed i usually collect the seeds I, I ran out of that so unfortunately i was stuck in a bind and i ended up buying a bag at the at the homebrew store anyway but just to let you know it's cheaper to buy it elsewhere and uh, some bitter orange peel which is only available from my homebrew shop or online so uh, and these are this is different than uh, what you would think is a sweet orange peel or navel oranges that you get from your grocery store. I've, I've used both in my beers over the years and although the sweet orange peel is good and has its own unique flavor profile, it does not mimic a Belgian wit beer nor a whole garden clone. So you definitely want to stick with the bitter orange peel. And there you go, those are my uh, boil additions. Uh, now I'm at the 60 minute mark. I'm gonna go ahead and throw in my first hop addition, my uh, one ounce of Hallertau hops. Let's go ahead and just dump that in there. And uh, we'll be back in a bit. All right, everyone, I'm down to the 10 minute mark. I'm gonna add my Czech Saz hops. Let's go ahead and dump those in there. All right, and we'll be back in a few more minutes. All right, this is the best part, folks. Down to the five minute mark. It's time to add our specialty ingredients, which include our, uh, our cracked coriander. I cracked this with a, a mallet uh, before I went ahead and put it in here. Everything's been cut in half and it smells delicious, so I'm just going to go ahead and dump that in there. I'm going to I'm going to dump my uh, my my bitter orange peel, just the whole packet. Dump that in there. And last but not least, those three tea bags of chamomile tea. All right, there we go. I'm going to go ahead and stir this in. All right, we're down to, down to the zero minute mark, turning off the uh, heat, and I'm gonna turn on my recirculating work chiller. Okay, it's been a short while later, thanks to my recirculating work chiller off camera here, which chilled this thing down in probably 15, 20 minutes, down to under 70 degrees, and uh, so that's, that's what I wanted. This is great, so let's, let's go ahead and rack this off and ferment it. So it's been a couple of days of fermentation here, so let's open the flap and see what we got. All right, there we go. You can see the uh, krausen on top there. It's all foaming up real nice. And it's uh, got a lot of activity here. It's probably hard for you to see this far away, but there's a lot of churn in there. So I moved my fermenter off the floor on top of my bar, and I'm going to remove this uh, little little jug here. I'm gonna go ahead and put my body attachment on and keg this thing. Gonna reattach my sanitized funnel here. Okay. Gonna attach my hose again. My 5 16 ID hose and the other end into the keg. Now I'm going to remove the stopper here so the airflow works great and doesn't uh, suck my solution into the beer. I'm going to open the valve here, folks. There we go. Into the keg. And there it goes into the keg. And there we are. Let's pull this out of here. There we go. I'm going to attach my CO2 line to this thing. And I'm going to pressurize this in my refrigerator for several days and get it up to uh, my carbonation. I'm using about uh, somewhere around 10 to 11 PSI in this keg. And it's going in the fridge to chill and carbonate until I'm ready to drink it. All right, folks, let's get a pull off this thing. Oh yeah, it looks really good. Nice color to that. Wow. Come on, hurry up, I wanna drink this. Hurry, pour faster. Oh man. All right, well, let's try this out. Let's give it a try. Oh, yeah, yeah, hold on. Okay, 
I could drink this all afternoon, and I know that you're not watching me, wanting to watch me uh, drink this all afternoon. So I'm going to put this down, and you can see the color is great. Light orange color-ish, orangish color. I like this in my Belgian whip beers. Tastes just like all my other beers, uh, my other Belgian whip beers, that is. I make this beer, I've been making this beer for probably 15 years now in some variation or another. And uh, past few years, I've kind of narrowed it down, and I haven't tweaked it too much. And this is my 2017 version. It's actually my probably my 2015 version. The last video I did on this beer years ago was I think it was back in 2000, maybe 13 or something. Uh, and that was the last time I made a tweak uh, before 2015 or so. And from then on, I've been using the same recipe. I've been able to make it repeatedly the same over and over again. And I attribute that to my brewing spreadsheet that I came up with to make my calculations consistent from batch to batch. Uh, and it has uh, it has worked out well for me. So there you go, folks. 2017 Larry Garden. Done. Ready to drink. And I'm ready to enjoy my summer and mow some lawns. So see you all later. If you like this video, please like. Subscribe if you have not. Please comment. Give me your feedback. And I will talk to you all next time. See ya. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out other videos on my YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe.